Good afternoon and uh, welcome to everyone on behalf of The Encounter. I'm Marta Zaknoun and I will moderate this event. Um, I would like first of all to sincerely thank the American Friends of the Parent Circle Families Forum for sponsoring this presentation. Robbie Damlin and Bassam Aramin, our guest speakers, have been uh, members of the Parent Circle Family Forum for many years. Um, and as they explicitly asked us, I'm not going to read their bios. They're going to tell us their story. Um, unfortunately, uh, Bassam could not be with us in person because of a health problem. But we are very fortunate because we have Robbie here with us and we have also a video recording from Bassam. So we will be able to hear their stories. Um, so Today, I'm very happy to have the opportunity to listen to Robbie and Bassam. Uh, I myself come from Jerusalem. Uh, I lived um, as a Christian Palestinian within the Israeli-Palestinian conflict for many years. And so I'm very eager to listen to them because I think uh, what is so special about today is that um, it's going to be a different conversation. Uh, all of us, I think, or many of us, I assume, have had at some point, uh, we've, we've engaged, we've partaken in a conversation about this conflict, and I think inevitably we all fall into the temptation of wanting to pick a side, to make clear-cut, you know, uh, decisions, and also to um, unconsciously almost absorb ideologies around us. You know, and so I think what is so interesting about today is that the point of departure is beyond ideologies, beyond slogans, and it comes from true personal experience. And this is what makes it so special. And this is why I think it's a great gift to all of us, starting from me. Um, so we're going to start with Robbie first. Wow, what a lot of people. <laughs> Thank you very much. I find myself in the weirdest of places. I mean, what is this nice Jewish girl doing in the Catholic encounter? <laughs> so I was thinking as I was listening to the last session, how extraordinary it all is that our work is so intertwined and that what we are all doing is more or less the same thing because we believe in transformation. Because if you don't think people can change, there isn't very much point in doing this work. And I was thinking also, what makes a person a survivor or a victim? You can choose. You know, and, and where are your first social acts of, of, where are your first acts of social justice? And I looked back, and I promise you, when you go home tonight and you sort of put your head on the pillow, start thinking about why you came here today. There must be a reason long ago that you did something to make a difference or you had some act of social justice. So normally, if we didn't have so many people, I would ask everybody to tell me what the worst thing they ever did or the first act of social justice. So I'll share with you mine. As you probably recognize by now, I'm not exactly an Israeli accent. So I was born in South Africa, and I remember my first act when I was five years old. There used to uh, be a man who delivered the milk with a horse and cart. And I love animals, and he used to beat the horse, and I couldn't bear it. And so me and my friend Barbara Fudge decided we would steal the horse. So I was about this high, and this was this huge cart horse. And we took carrots, and we went to the dairy, and we stole the horse. And we brought it home, and we put it in my tennis court. And of course, my father came home, and you can imagine how delighted he was to find a horse in the tennis court. And um, shortly after that, I got sent to a very British boarding school. <laughs> And I was very naughty, so they sent me to a convent. 
So I was thinking, you know, where does this all come from? What made me a survivor? There are so many acts in my life. And you know, when the army came to tell me that David had been killed by a Palestinian sniper, apparently one of the first things that I said is you may not kill anybody in the name of my child. I have no idea that I even said that, but I was told that that's what I said. And that is quite extraordinary because it was almost a premonition of what I was going to do with my life. There's nothing worse than losing a child. It's as if somebody comes and tears your heart out and changes your whole perspective on life. No joy is ever the same, but you can make choices. Do you die with your child? as many people do, maybe not physically, but they stay at home and they do nothing? Or do you want to make a difference and try to prevent other families from experiencing this pain? And I knew that I wanted to do something because we had to do something to end this madness. And I remember um, the very first time, it was, must have been three months after David was killed, they asked me to come to a demonstration in Tel Aviv and talk to something like 60,000 people. It couldn't have been more than three months. Normally, I never write anything, and people don't actually believe me that I just make it up as I go along. But for this, I wrote because I really wanted to have good Hebrew. And um, I read it, and I, I walked up onto the stage, and I suddenly found this speech about a year ago and I realized that it was a premonition of what I was going to do with the rest of my life. Because in the speech, I said, we cannot do this alone. We must have a partner in the Palestinians. We share the same pain. So a religious Jewish man came to see me after that. I became quite infamous, I would say. I wouldn't say too famous for the things that I said about the occupation. And, uh, he came to see me and he invited me to a weekend in East Jerusalem with other bereaved parents, both Palestinian and Israeli. I didn't really want to go, but he was more of a bulldozer than me, and I promise you that's hard to find. <laughs> so um, I decided, okay, I'll go. And when I walked into the room, I looked into the eyes of the Palestinian mothers and I realized almost immediately that we shared the same pain and that the tears are the same color and that we could be the most incredible, powerful f force if we would stand on the same stage and we would talk in the same voice for nonviolence and reconciliation. And I just closed my office and decided this is it, this is my life from now on. And I started to travel all over the world and I thought I was really a big deal. You know, I could speak English, and um, I went to the House of Lords and to Congress and to hip-hop concerts and wherever anybody invited me. And by the way, do not be selective about who you will talk to, because those you don't agree with, if you will not talk to them, they will become more radical. It's a problem worldwide. So I was really very pleased with myself. And then one night, I was sitting at my computer, and there was a knock on the door. And I went to the door, and I opened it, and I saw three soldiers. When you see three soldiers, it can only mean one thing. So I slammed the door in their face. I thought, I cannot lose another child. This is beyond anything that I can handle. And they kept knocking and knocking and knocking, and eventually I opened the door. And they said, we came to tell you that we caught the man who killed David. There was no sense of joy or any kind of revenge or anything in my heart. There was only a fear now to see if I'm honest. You see, you can walk around the world and you can talk about peace and love and forgiving and you can read bad poetry, but do you really, really mean it? And this was a really difficult time for me because I didn't know you know, I thought, how can I, there's now a face to the man who killed my child. How can I go around the world talking about reconciliation if I'm not willing to face this? I didn't sleep for something like three months. 
really and honestly, I was wandering around my apartment all night long thinking, what can I do? Eventually, I wrote a letter to the family of Thaya. Thaya is the name of the man who killed my son. There were two Palestinians who delivered the letter from our group. And in the letter, I told them all about David. David was a student at Tel Aviv University, and he was studying for his master's in the philosophy of education. And <clears throat> he was part of the peace movement. And he didn't really want to serve in the occupied territories at all. And he came to see me before uh, he had to do his reserves. You know, in Israel, after you finish the army, you have to continue to serve for many, many years, like three weeks every year. And he said, Ima, I don't know what to do. If I don't go, what will happen to my students? He was teaching philosophy to students who were going to be inducted into the army. Is that the right example? If I don't go, what happens to my soldiers? He was the officer. And if I go, I will treat people with dignity. And so will all my soldiers. So here you are. You see, you think you know the person behind the gun. I don't think you do. And here's a young man who's grown up in this dilemma of not wanting to, to carry a gun and not wanting to be violent and yet being swept along with the mess of, of um, people in agreement. Um, I also told the, the family that um, we had to meet. We owed it to our children and grandchildren. I told them about the parent circle. We are more than 600 families, everybody who has lost an immediate family member. And what we believe in, the vision that we have for the future is that there has to be a framework for a reconciliation process as an integral part of any future peace agreement, political peace agreement. Because if there isn't that, at best we can have a ceasefire until the next time. So all the work that we're doing on the ground is geared towards that. I, of course, after the letter was delivered, I'm not the most patient character in the Middle East, as I think Maria can probably tell you by now, who has looked after me like a little girl since I arrived. Um, it was just, I imagined that I would immediately get a letter back from the sniper. But of course, you know, one has to realize that there's no such thing as instant reconciliation. It is a process. It may never happen. And so every day I was there and I waited and it took something like three years, I would think, until I got a letter which came through the Palestinian website telling me that I'm crazy. Yes, I can't say mad, because mad means, means angry here, right? It's like I was in Congress. Can I tell the story? Why not? <laughs> I, was in, <laughs> I was in Congress, and um, we had like this briefing. And I was giving a whole big speech about the parent circle, because we lost our budget, because your beloved um, administration decided to cut all cross-border uh, cross activity funding which is something like 30% of our funding. And so um, I said, the parent circle really needs a sugar daddy. And there was this dead silence, and then everybody started laughing, because it doesn't mean that in South Africa or in England. So you have to be very careful with words. <laughs> you know, if you, and this is actually a lesson in how to understand other people's culture. We don't normally understand other people's culture, and so we go blundering in and doing the most terrible things to offend people. What we must learn somewhere along the line is good manners. You'll be amazed how that works. In any event, um, this letter came after three years, and it was from Thaya, and he said I was crazy, and that I should stay away from his family and that he killed 10 people to free Palestine. Well, 
I actually knew that that wasn't exactly true because his parents had told us that when he was a very little boy, he saw his uncle violently killed by the Israeli army. And then he lost two uncles in the second uprising. So I would think he went on a path of revenge. He became a folk hero. And, um, but I will give you something if you don't take anything away from this whole talk that we had now. When I got that letter and when I wrote the letter, that is when I gave up being a victim. He could no longer affect who I am. My life is no longer contingent on what this man does or says. I'm free. When you give up being a victim of circumstance, you become free, and that is the most extraordinary feeling. And so what happened is two filmmakers arrived and said, would I go with them to South Africa to look at the Truth and Reconciliation Commission? There's enough gray hair here to tell the young people what that was, because I haven't got the patience anymore. And um, we wanted to meet perpetrators and victims who had given evidence at the Truth and Reconciliation Commission after Mandela came out of jail. And we wanted to learn lessons on, on what we could learn for Israel and Palestine. And um, what I wanted personally was to look at the meaning of, what is the meaning of forgiving? You might all ask yourselves that same question, and <laughs> again, it's such a personal thing. Do you come to it through your religion? Is it something that is inborn within you that you recognize that if you cannot forgive, you will be a prisoner for the rest of your life? How do you come to all of that? I wanted to meet people who'd actually experienced physical forgiving. And I met a South African woman whose daughter had been killed by uh, the African uh, military wing. And she'd gone to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission and she said to the people who killed her daughter, I forgive you. And I thought, what does she mean? I want to understand. And I went to meet her and she said her definition of forgiving, forgiving is giving up your just right to revenge. That meant something to me. And then I met the man who actually sent the people to kill her daughter. And I thought he was gonna be some kind of monster. He turns out to be this incredibly in man, incredible man of integrity. And he said, by her forgiving me, she released me from the prison of my inhumanity. How extraordinary is that statement? Imagine. By her forgiving me, she released me from the prison of my, uh, of my inhumanity. And so I came back to Israel, and I decided it's time to meet uh, the sniper, but everything's in the way. You know, like I need permission from the Minister of Justice, and I need permission from the police, and I need a go-between. I don't use the word mediator. I need a go-between, and who's the most perfect person? In a few minutes, you will see a wonderful message from Bassam, who, by the way, sends his love to all of you. And he was the one that I wanted to be the mediator, and you'll know exactly why after you see him. And um, eventually, I realized that the person that's in the way is actually me. It's a scary thing to do, to go and meet the person who killed your child. But I decided I have to do this more for completion than anything else. And so I went to meet the Minister of Justice. You realize that in Israel we have a lot of elections lately. I don't know if you've noticed. Every couple of months we have a new minister of something. So um, that minister was a minister of justice and she gave me permission. And she gave permission for Bassam to be the mediator. Not mediator, the go-between. And um, we were waiting for the police. And then we had elections. And then we got a minister of just us, who had no intention of letting me go into jail. So that's where the story is at the moment. But what an incredible gratitude I have in my life for all the wonderful people that I've met along the way and all the understanding that people can change. Thank you.
was how, many, how much time was that? That was beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Robbie. <laughs> it's very hot in here, no? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, we will now uh, watch the video from Bassam. As I mentioned earlier, unfortunately, because of health, uh, issues he could not be with us, uh, but we will watch his witness and then we will have the opportunity to ask Robbie some quest questions to both of them. Hello everyone. Uh, thank you very much for inviting us uh, for this opportunity to talk to you. Uh, I will start with my personal story uh, my name is Bassam. I am a Palestinian. I'm a Muslim, uh, and which is by chance, it's not my decision, but I am very proud to be human beings. Uh, uh, briefly, it's very difficult to be a Palestinian. It's very difficult to grow up under strange occupation, people that you don't know, they don't speak your language, and you don't know why they come to control your life, to occupy you. Uh, it's very easy to become a fighter or a warrior. It's very easy to hate those strangers. You don't need education to hate the occupation. Uh, for that, uh, at the age of 13, I start with other four kids, uh, a local military group, we call it, and we start by raising the Palestinian flag, which was a crime in that time, uh, because we note that those soldiers become crazy when they see the Palestinian flag, and we just want to make them crazy. This is how we start our struggle. Uh, at the age of 16, we find some old weapons in a cave, uh, with two grenades and other military materials that we don't know how to use it. But two of my friends throw the two grenades on the Israeli soldiers, patrols in our village near Hebron. And of course, in that time, make no harm anyone because they don't know how to use it in a professional way. And one year later, we have been arrested. So the first one get 21 years in jail. Uh, 19, 15, 14, and I had seven years. I learned in jail, if you know your enemy, you can defeat him or you can kill him. If you only hate him, you will kill yourself. So I start to study Hebrew, their language, to know how to kill or to defeat my enemy. Uh, then shortly I watch a movie about the Holocaust by chance. Uh, and for the Palestinians, we don't believe in the Holocaust. We think it's a big lie. And they use this big lie to justify their crimes against our people. Because of this big lie, we lost our country. We became people of refugees. So we paid the price of this crime, which has never happened. For that, we don't believe it. And we don't want to know anything about it. In spite of that, I want to enjoy seeing this movie as kind of revenge, to see someone torture those who wish, kill them, arrest them, occupy them, at least because I am in their jails and because they occupied my people. Well, what happened after a few minutes, I found myself crying with sympathy with those innocent people. I start to hide my tears from other prisoners. I cannot believe that they are human beings can do the same to other human beings. I say to myself, it's just a movie. 
nothing like this in the reality. But I decide that I want to understand more about this big line. If it's really happened or it's just a movie. It takes many years. And after so many years, in 2010, 2011, before nine years, I make my master degree about the Holocaust in Bradford University in the UK. Then after that, I start to visit these camps in Germany. I go back to jail. In jail, it's a long seven years. Briefly, they teach us how to hate them, how to, to be more determined to continue fighting them because of their brutal behavior. They didn't arrest us, and we go through a rehabilitation process. No, their goal is to kill our humanity every moment, because for them, we are the bad guys. And for us, of course, they are the bad guys. They are the occupiers. And we are freedom fighters. For that, we have a mission to survive in order to continue our way, our struggle, to liberate ourselves and our land. I get released in 1992 after seven years and I still believe in armed struggle as the only way to talk to those people. When I say people, I believe, I, I think it's the Israeli people, because those are the Israelis that we know. I mean the Israeli soldiers, the Israeli army. Those are the kind of the Israelis that the Palestinians know, in the checkpoints, in our villages, in our cities, in our refugee camps. So it's very easy to justify your struggle against militants. 1993, we have Oslo Agreement for the first time between PLO and Israel. Suddenly we have peace. We start to see the Israelis in our cities everywhere. We go everywhere to Israel. And for the normal people, this is peace, freedom of movement. Most of the Israelis and the Palestinians, they support this agreement because they want to live in a normal life, in peace. And this is what happened to me. I am also part of the Palestinian people. It's not a personal problem between my family and Israel. So I support this agreement and I start to believe that that's it. Finally, we have peace. We start to think even the collective level in a normal way to prepare ourselves that we can live together. And this is the reality. In fact, I get married and I start to have kids. And suddenly I have six kids. And those kids become my Palestine, my homeland, my world. And I want to do everything possible to protect them. Which is unfortunately, it's impossible mission. If you live in Palestine and Israel, it's not the same level, but still, you have no safe place for yourself. And sometimes if you survive, it's just by chance, which is not a normal life. I discovered in 1994, that more than 100 years we are trying to kill each other, to defeat each other, and we did everything possible. In spite, you know, Israel, with the states, United States of America, with the rest of the world, against the Palestinians, but we forget to die. We still here, with more blood, more pain, more victims, and uh, through negotiation, we understand that maybe we can get some kind of agreement. Then I start to ask myself why I spent seven years in jail, the Israeli occupation jails, as long as our leaders can sit down and achieve such agreement. Why they didn't make it 20 years, 30 years ago? 
40 years ago, they will save thousands of lives from both sides. Then I start to be active in my society in the Palestinian side, that we need to change our way to achieve our goal. It's the same goal. It's to end the Israeli occupation. We never change it. We will never change it. But how? I get to understand that the Israeli people must come to support us to end their own occupation because this is our common enemy. In fact, to support themselves to stop to be occupiers and oppressors. In 2002, I hear in the Israeli media about something called refuseniks, which is ex-Israeli soldiers and officers who refuse to serve in the occupied territories or in Palestine because they want to live in a moral place, because they don't want to be part of this illegal and immoral occupation. I wish to meet those people to understand why they refuse to continue occupying us. And in 2005, we had the first meeting between four Palestinians, ex-prisoners, I was one of them, with seven ex-Israeli officers and soldiers. It was the most difficult meeting for each one of us. We hate each other. We don't trust each other. And we did our best to kill each other physically from both sides. This meeting take place near Bethlehem for at least four hours. And it's continued for one year to discover that we are the same. We want to kill each other because we want peace and security for ourselves, our families, and our people. Of course, each one from his point of view. After one year, we became 300 members, all of them ex-prisoners and ex-soldiers, ex-enemies. So we decide to lay down our weapons and we create a movement, we call it Combatants for Peace, and we start to work together. Our slogan was what Nelson Mandela says. If you want to make peace with your enemy, you need to work with your enemy. Then he became your partner. It's not only to talk to your enemy, to work together against your common enemy, which is the occupation and the hatred and the violence. And this is what happened. We start to work together. Two years later, on the 16th of January, 2007, an Israeli border police teenager shoot and kill my 10 years old daughter, Abir. The smell of the flower. 10 years old, my third child, in front of her school, 9.30 in the morning, from a distance of 15 to 20 meters, in her head, from the back. She was with her sister, Arin, and two other girls in front of her school. She fell down, and two days later, she passed away in Hadassah Hospital in Jerusalem. It's the most difficult thing that could happen to anyone on earth. Especially Abir was 10 years old. She don't know anything about the conflict. She don't know anything about the Palestinians and the Israelis. She paid the highest price because she was in the wrong place the wrong time, and because she was a Palestinian, unfortunately. The most difficult thing is to recognize that there is no revenge, which is very easy. It means to kill the rest of the Jewish on earth. You will never, ever meet Abir again. And the problem, it's nothing to do with your pain. It's 24 hours. Forever, whatever happened, you need to know how to live with this pain, how to manage this pain. 
Always I said, one Israeli soldier killed my daughter. But more than 100 ex-Israeli soldiers from combatants for peace built Abir's garden in her school, in her memory, with the help of American organization called the Rebuilding Alliance. One can kill, 100 can build. I want to prove that we can use our pain in a different way, not only for revenge. And revenge, it not, it's not always to kill. We can take revenge in a different way. I believe when Jesus said, love your enemy, it's kind of revenge. Because when you love your enemy, he, will, he cannot harm you. You will eliminate him with your morals, with your humanity. In fact, I joined the parent circle two days after I lost my daughter. I know this organization two years before I lost my daughter. Because one of the co-founders of Combatants for Peace from the Israeli side was a brave brother. He lost his sister, 14 years old, Smadar al-Hanan, to a Palestinian suicide bombers on the 4th of September, 1997. And I get to know his father, my brother, Rami Hanan. We become a very close friends. Always I want to ask him about his daughter, about, about Smadar. But I said, maybe he forget, because sometimes we laugh. He looks normally. Then after what happened to, to Abir, I understand that he never forget, he will never forget. We just try to escape from our pain to our pain. There's no other way. I know Robi, my dear Robi. She was a little bit famous in the Palestinian media. So I know the parent circle, their message. But in my worst dream, I don't want to join this amazing group. We are more than 620 families, Israelis and Palestinians. We get to understand that we have the moral authority to raise up our voice and to say no more blood. We don't want to see more blood. We paid the highest price and nothing worth to sacrifice the blood of our kids for. Jerusalem, we love Jerusalem. It's a holy place for the Christians, in spite they keep silent right now. It's a holy place for the Jewish people. It's the paradise for the Muslims. Any Muslim around the world believe and wish to die in Jerusalem without any connection to the Israelis or the Jewish or the occupation. Because we believe the paradise will be there in Jerusalem. We call it the capital of the sky, the key of the sky the widest city on earth, so we love it. And I believe millions of people are ready to die just for the name of Jerusalem. Instead of to enjoy this love to Jerusalem together, we kill each other for Jerusalem, but we meet each other under the ground. And I am not sure if Jerusalem know who we are. We need to decide who's more important, our lives, or the holy stones of Jerusalem or other holy places. In the parent circle, we want to prove that we are partners. We can be partners only. We don't need to love each other. So we prove because of the blood of our kids that we can be partners. We can be friends. We can be brothers. And we can be family, because we are the same. I wish you peace and justice. And thank you very much for listening and for giving me this opportunity to talk to you.
Robbie, I want to ask you a question. I guess it's for both of you in a way. Uh, Bassam touched upon this at a certain point uh, when he talked about the Holocaust and um, that generally it's something that is not accepted as a fact in Palestinian society. And he said how he was moved in prison when he saw that movie and he cried. And so my question to you is how much for both sides um, is the process of knowing the other and opening to his narrative a part also of the process of reconciliation and forgiveness? Because as a personal journey, you had to be able to forgive, but then who are you forgiving, right? Who are the people we're talking about, right? So can you tell us about this, the concept of knowledge and this, you know, there's so many questions in what you just asked me. I know. I have so many. <laughs> um, I think mainly the work that we're doing is to make that emotional breakthrough through a person telling you their personal story. It's very hard to resist. You know, even the hardest of hearts and people who don't agree with you, if they hear Bassam talking and telling his story, how could they not be moved? So that is the, um, I would say, the main way that we work in the parent circle. And we run uh, a lot of workshops where people tell their story, but where also they have to learn, not, it's not all about hugging and kissing and uh, eating hummus. It's much deeper than that, you know? And to really tell the truth to somebody till they will get to the point where they will trust you regardless. Now, here's the, di the difference between mediation and dialogue. One is all about listening with empathy, whether you agree or not. And the other one is a compromise. So I'm all for dialogue in the meantime. And so that's how we work even with kids. You know, we go into Israeli schools and something like four or five hundred schools, each having about eight classrooms, nine classrooms of 17-year-old kids. Um, how many in the audience have been to Israel and Palestine? Well, quite a lot. Well, the average 17-year-old kid has never met a Palestinian in his life. So if I go into his classroom with Bassam, and for the first time they really experience Bassam's narrative, and now, of course, you all understand why I want him to be the go-between, um, they cannot help but be moved. They don't all become Martin Luther King, okay? <laughs> but when they go to the army, they have recognized, maybe for the first time, the humanity in the other. And that's a really important part of all of the work that we do. And so it's the same when I go into Palestinian villages, where I never tell my other son where I am, because I'm not really allowed to go there. What the hell is going to happen to me anyway? And um, when you... Oh, you're not supposed to say what the hell, right? Okay. <laughs> if you walk into a, a Palestinian home, and I believe that women need to come to the table now, right? Yes. Right. Women need to come to the table, and so I do a lot of work in the West Bank with women. And when you first walk into the house, there's a kind of antagonism until they recognize and until you tell your story, why would they think I'm any different? Who've they met ever that's not in uniform or who's not a settler? So why would they see me as somebody different, just a mother with the same pain as them? So all of the work that we're doing is kind of geared to this kind of introducing each other, ourselves to each other through our stories. We have a summer camp, which is real good fun, and my grandchildren are now, sort of have been for the past couple of years, and are going to be the facilitators. And I'm so proud because I didn't push them to do this. You know, they did it of their own accord. And it's just extraordinary to watch the women's group growing and seeing how they are going through a course now on reconciliation. And I just... We cannot stop this work. You know, whatever it is, you have to take it into your own communities too. Mm -hmm. 
because the world is becoming polarized. It's either pro-Israel or pro-Palestine. And by doing that, what you're doing is importing our conflict into your country and creating hatred between Jews and Muslims. And I'm sure you don't want to do that. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess along the lines of... Uh, <laughs> I paid them in the front. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I guess my other question, I was thinking of Bassam's story. So this man has obviously a change of heart while he's in jail. He, he comes out of jail and becomes what you may call a peace activist in a way, or at least sits at the table with ex-military people and talks to them. And he says the conversation is difficult. It's not easy. And then he works towards peace. He works towards this dialogue. Um, and his daughter is tragically killed in this conflict. So, and David was in the peace movement. So how do people that believe so strongly in peace, how can they keep believing and nurturing this? And I guess, defending this concept of reconciliation through this pain. How, how, what is it that gives you hope? I don't know. There's not a recipe for this, but I think it's a lot of introspective work all the time. You know, I, um, this is hard to say, but that man who killed David didn't kill David because he was David. If he'd known him, he never could have done that. He killed his uniform. That's the truth. Now, that's very hard to say. But if we start to really look within and to understand, it's very hard for me to explain to you. I mean, I've watched myself change because I've got a tongue like a viper, you know, and I could wipe everybody out in a minute. <laughs> and... Um, but that doesn't serve any purpose whatsoever because all you do is you close people down. And so you have to learn that there's a rhetoric of peace and you have to really believe it within yourself and that really means that you have to be at peace with yourself. And I'm so grateful for that, you know? I, people can't actually understand when I talk about gratitude but because they say, how can you be grateful you lost a child? Of course I lost a child. It's the worst thing that can happen to anybody. And I'm a fixer, but I couldn't fix this. But I'm so grateful that I could take something within me and touch other people's hearts and that maybe just change somebody that they would become nonviolent. It's not for me to, to make you love anybody, but I might make you respect them as a human being and see their humanity. That's the only thing I can really do. So, you were telling me the other day about Bushra. Bushra is a Palestinian mom that you will see later in a video clip, a song uh, that will conclude our meeting. Um, can you tell us about that episode? I think it's... Uh, All right, for this I stand up because I respect her. <laughs> um, I told you I, I move around in the West Bank a lot with women. And I went to this meeting and there were only Palestinian women there and I was the only Israeli. And this woman walked in and you'll get to know her quite soon through this clip. She had on a, like a necklace with a picture of her son which meant to me that was very clear that she'd lost her child. And she recognized that I was Israeli and she wanted to run away. And this is maybe the story of, of how you make that emotional breakthrough. So I caught her at the door and I asked her, um, please stay, I want you to tell me what happened to your son. And we sat down and she sat with her back to me like this, which is like really rude, you know. But I, I, wanted, I wanted her to understand that I was there with empathy. 
And I asked her who she lost and how old was he and what happened and she told me the whole story and then I said, would you like to see a picture of David? And she reluctantly said, okay. So she turned towards me and I had the picture in my hand and she said, haram. That means what a pity. And that was her emotional breakthrough. Today, Bushra is one of the most active women in the parent circle. She donated blood with me. She's traveled all over the world with me. For the first time in her life, I took her out of her village and we went to Lincoln Center to women in the world. I got her addicted to hamburgers <laughs> and, and also took her to, high, to um, what's the park, Central Park on the horse and cart. And she sat on the stage and told her story and the whole audience were in tears and everybody stood up to applaud her. And it's extraordinary that I recognized the transformation in Bushra. You see, she was very, very miserable and sad all the time. And, uh, but slowly, slowly she started to tell the story of Mahmoud. And eventually we traveled all over the world together and then um, we went to Toronto also to women in the world, and she made a joke on the stage. And then I realized that her transformation was complete. And before we made this clip, which we're going to show you now, um, she made one of those necklaces for me with a picture of David. You'll see it in the clip. And that's the ultimate act of love. So let's watch the clip. Yes? What actually happened in the 1990s? Well, let's... What? <laughs> Disappear 
We'll shatter that wall. We'll watch it fall. Together, sister, we can come. Give me your So can we go now? Sorry? That's it? One more minute. <laughs> <laughs> so just to conclude, I just want to say that the awareness of the, of the people we heard today, of Bassam and Robi, in of itself is a miracle in the Middle East. And it generates a new reality in that place. It generates a new culture. And when you live in... In, in Palestine or in Israel, I think inevitably it, the, the conflict shapes you. It shapes your identity and the conflict is intertwined a little bit with this antagonism that you have towards the other, inevitably. And so um, to be able to live outside of the conflict and to form a new identity, to actually be defined by your own terms to be free, to really be free, to be, to be free because you forgive is, uh, is something very rare and exceptional. And um, I think what really struck me is that both of you, you just let forgiveness sort of conquer everything. And so forgiveness becomes this higher ideal that really encompasses all the other ideals, which is your love for your homeland, your love for your family, your love for your community. Um, and it's really not to be taken for granted because to be able to love your homeland in a different way, just as Bassam said, you know, you can, you can love the stones, but then what? You love the stones under the ground. What's the point of that? Um, and I would like to conclude with a quote of John Paul II because uh, he often was quoted about peace in the Middle East and often people quoted the part about there's no peace without justice and uh, they kind of sort of left out sometimes the piece of th about forgiveness which is actually very visible in what we saw in your experience. So. True peace, therefore, is the fruit of justice, that moral virtue and legal guarantee which ensure full respects for rights and responsibilities and the just distribution of benefits and burdens. But because human justice is always fragile and imperfect, subject as it is to the limitation and egoism of individuals and groups, it must include, be completed by the forgiveness which heals and rebuilds troubled human relations from their foundation. Forgiveness inhabits people's hearts before it becomes a social reality. Only to the degree that an ethics and a culture of forgiveness prevail can we hope for a politics of forgiveness expressed in society's attitude and laws so that through them justice takes on a more human character. So thank you, Robbie, for witnessing thank this you. to us. And thank you.